Um, okay, so this is this is the beginning of uh, what seems to be a two or three part series class, um, which was discovered last <laughs> night. So uh, it's it's coming out of a provocation from Mr. LaRouche himself, uh, having written in his his paper of music, science or fantasy. So there's been a lot of buzz around our youth movement around like what what the hell this guy's talking about, um, and essentially what the question that's provoked in my mind is something that Kepler brought up, which is to what extent would a false hypothesis yield the truth? Like, do you? How do you know what you're hearing or what you're seeing is true? Actually, I should say truthful. Because by saying true, you already are assuming a pretty static universe, that that object or that idea is just true in and of itself. But that neglects the idea of motion, of an ever-changing universe, which is what we actually exist in. Um, so I mean, if you if you think about today, we have you know where are you going? <laughs> so we have um, Dick Cheney, George Bush, in the White House. Their lovely seats, while well, Congress is gone, and they're stinking up the place as the leaders of our country. And you want to? Th I want you to think about. Just put your mind uh, in the sen in the sense like through into the population. What is our population doing day in and day out? What are people doing? What are they working on? How what are their discussions like with people around them? Um, because it does how we think have something to do with the fact that we have a monkey and a sociopath in the White House? Or is it just something completely separate? The way that we think has really no significance or uh, effect on how society unfolds or what happens in society. It's just something separate. Like, oh, I just, I just think this way. That's what you, what you think is what you think. What I think is what I think. I'm just gonna keep my own opinion. And so, you know, a lot of people will say. George Bush, I think he's a hard worker. He's a he's a good man. He's a family man, and he's just he just works hard, <laughs> and he's a religious man. He loves God, and that could be their hypothesis. But where where is that hypothesis going to take them? Are they going to live as a happy pig in a pen? Or are they going to live some other some existence that would actually create some type of profound, uh, profound problem for the next generation to actually solve? Is that what their existence means? Um, I mean, some people might even say Dick Cheney's good looking. Oh God. <laughs> I mean, that's a strange <laughs> idea. So, I mean, can you believe what your senses are telling you? Right? You have, as, as we were, what's so funny? I know, it's a funny idea. So we have about five senses, right? We are born, we came out of the womb, hopefully, and we have five senses. We can see, we can hear, feel, taste, and touch. And that uh, to some people, it actually makes us very uh, close to animals. They see, hear, feel, taste, and touch as well. Yeah, actually, we smell too <laughs> sometimes. So, I mean, is can you believe what your senses are telling you, or are those senses a pathway for you to discover something which only the creative human mind can discover? It's your road, it's your, I almost said the yellow brick road, but that's not, <laughs> well, I just said it, so. But that, 
it's the road, it's your pathway to understanding what is more truthful within the universe. And this is something that <coughs> Mr. LaRouche actually, I think they're looking for our meeting. So um, there's something that Mr. LaRouche brought up, or Lynn brought up uh, in his latest paper, Music, Science, or Fantasy. And how many of our guests actually think that there, there, w there is a way to discover that which is truthful? Can you discover an idea of truth? Mm -hmm. um, do you think that we have the capability of discovering truth? Mm -hmm. It's not easy. It's a good idea. Yeah, right. Take some time. What about you, Jessica? Mm-hmm. Okay, that's valid. Um, well, I'm going to, uh, this is a quote from Lynn himself, and he says, he actually just went through uh, the idea of, of our senses, and he calls our senses these biological forms of instrumentation, which um, are, is very exciting. But then he says, to put that same point in another way, we should know from experience that when we accept sense experience as what is called sense certainty, we are lying to ourselves. Each of our senses presents us with a certain specific kind of image of the concurrent experience of the same event actually experienced by two or more senses in terms which are qualitatively in contradiction to all among the other particular modes of sense perception as such. Therefore, truth is that which must be recognized as not the image of reality as presented as the evidence of any type of sense perception as such. Truth lies not in perception as such, but in ironical forms of changes within the, within the whole of the lapsed physical space-time of that which we must discover experimentally is to be perceived as a relevant quality of change in state. It is the existence of a qualitative change of state, especially an inducible change of qualitative state, which reflects the kind of quality of experience to which the conception of perceptions must be subjugated. So uh, this is from Lynn himself addressing this idea of truth, something that our generation basically was raised to think didn't really exist. That what you knew was based on the observations or whatever you could tell from your senses. That that was your only relationship to truth. And um, our youth movement is rediscovering Kepler's method. Those of you that were here for the econ class today uh, have gone through quite a a, a, an intense day of activity um, to really understand some of these ideas that we're, we're, that we're dealing with and that we're taking out into the population as a responsibility because, you know, as Harley went through, there's a serious breakdown of the system that who's going to step up to the plate and take the responsibility to solve some of these problems? Who but the people in this room? So, um, you know, as I was saying, we're, we're reviving Kepler's and Bach's method. And this is something that isn't really done anywhere else. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you were reminded of any of your class, your other classrooms today, but hopefully you, you probably weren't because of the different method of approach that we take. Um, but Kepler, this is a... Uh, 
collection. We're working through his new astronomy right now on how to rediscover universal gravitation and what his specific method of thinking, his hypotheses, how would he develop these hypotheses to uncover uh, a closer approximation to truth or what is truthful. When you look up in the heavens, and I was thinking about this during Harley's class, like, it's pretty amazing. You have like this vast sense of sky above you and you realize conceptually that you're part of a very large, extremely, infinitely large universe. But that the irony is that it's most accessible to us, humans that we have the capability of becoming most in intimate with how the universe is organized and how it functions. And we play a specific role in determining how that's always going to change. So, um, I mean, Kepler, throughout the new astronomy, he basically determines that, you know, it's neither sight nor sound that act independently. That you have these two, you know, you could call them opinions, <laughs> if you want to treat them as such. But you have these two opinions that, uh, based on your senses, are dealing with the same subject matter, but yet don't uh, exist independently of each other. You don't understand something just through what you see. There's some other faculty that is determining your understanding of that. Um, and what he gets into is that what's created, and this is what we'll get into in the music uh, a little bit later is you actually have this third sense, or what LaRouche calls a transcendental sense, something of a higher order that's acting to organize how you can understand that contradiction or that paradox. Um, so in, the, in a funny sense, you're actually getting a sense of a universal principle. Um, so, I mean, Kepler's senses were tingling a lot. Uh, you could tell in the book, he's having a lot of fun. And so we've had, we've, we've, as the LIM, the LaRouche Youth Movement, have been developing a relationship with Kepler. And, I mean, it's only like, what, a 377 year age difference? Or something like that? <coughs> Hundreds of years, it's not too bad. But um, he is dead. I mean, he died in 1630. And, I mean, is it possible for us to have a relationship with him, even though he's been dead for hundreds of years? I mean, how is it, where, in what capacity, or where does he actually exist? So, um, we're going to go to... This is in our, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> what is this, oh my god, why isn't it going, oh, there, it was already there, no, 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 you can't use that, oh, whoops, sorry, let me use, uh, this one, <laughs> You just saw <laughs> this, uh, say this. All, all our guests should take a Give good look light. at this. Yeah. You should take a very good look at this. Um, <coughs> 
This is Kepler'sDiscovery.com. This has nothing to do with our organization. If it has anything to do with our organization, it's a serious attempt to lure young people uh, away from what's actually truthful. This is to give you an idea, well, well shoot, LaRouche, okay, well, these guys seem to be doing the same thing, so I, you know, I'm just going to go seek them out, see what they're doing. And I mean, it took a lot of work and a lot of money to do this, so we're obviously doing something right if our enemy is so freaked out that they have to create an elaborate web page to plagiarize the work, the actual physical work that we've done as a movement over the last two or three years. And so the reason I started, I have, you know, uh, with the idea of to what extent would a false hypothesis yield the truth, how would anybody in the population looking at this be able to determine the difference between this and this? This is our website. This is a product of work that's been done in, Mr. in Lynn's basement. Um, for months at a time. Intense research, intense application, um, an intense amount of passion to discover that which Kepler was able to discover. Ke did I say Kepler? Kepler? Kepler. Okay, sorry. Um, so Kepler was dealing with the same thing. He was asking the same questions back in the 1600s when he saw Ptolemy's model. We're going to take a look at three different models quickly. Um, any of our guests, we've, a bunch of us have worked through, a majority of us have worked through this. You can take some time with um, somebody around you to get a much more thorough understanding of this. Uh, but I'm going to go through it pretty swiftly so that you just get a, a general idea. But Kepler is dealing with the fact that you know, you have these three different systems that are being talked about. You know, you've got Ptolemy's system, Copernicus's system, and Brahe's system. <coughs> and essentially what he concludes at the end is even though with the Ptolemy system, you've got, what, the Earth in the center, you've got the Sun rotating around the Earth, and then you've got Mars rotating around an epicycle on its epicycle in a consistent fashion around the Sun and the Earth. So then you've got Mr. Copernicus. So then you've got Copernicus here, who's got the Sun in the middle, Earth rotating around the Sun, and Mars pretty much rotating around both, almost but not quite. Then you have Mr. Brahe's, which is somewhat similar to <laughs> insanity. No, I'm just kidding. So you have the <coughs> Earth in the center, the Sun rotating around the Earth, and then you've got Mars doing that funny loop around both. Now, to anybody, what our basement team was able to do is discover the fact that even though they have these elaborate systems that have been created to describe the observations that they made, all three of them essentially communicate the same thing. And the bottom one, uh, this is a much more zoomed out picture, but we've ultimately superimposed these systems on each other. So even though we had, you know, Ptolemy had the Earth in the center, you have these three different systems, this is what you end up with. That's kind of strange, isn't it? How could that happen? So, the funny thing is, Kepler takes it up again. Can you go closer with the lines up? 
the line. Yeah, let's go ahead and draw the line for us. Uh, you can. Oops, sorry. You mean the line to the side? Yeah. Um, basically you have, uh, hang on, let me just make this. I can do straight out. Are you going to go through it? Oh. Yeah, the yellow line is the, uh, where the earth sees the sun and the red line is where the earth sees Mars. And so, in all three of them, Oops. the lines point in the same direction. So you know the different shapes. Oh. <coughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. They have stuff on the harmonies too. Oh yeah, and the harmonies. Yeah. And they have a homework page. What? Yeah, they have a homework page too. So, uh, <laughs> Michael, can you repeat that? Yeah, sure. So the, the yellow lines, the line that the, if you see in the top one, the yellow lines where the the earth sees the, the earth sun. Sees the sun. So yeah. like in Ptolemy on the far left, the earth's in the center, and the sun's going around it. The yellow line goes to the earth, from the earth to the sun. And then in Copernicus, in the middle one, now the sun's in the middle. But the yellow lines are always parallel in each box. They point in the same direction. And same with the red one. And it's true for all three. So if you look at the bottom, like when you watch that, it's zoomed out. So now you can see how both, both lines of perspective, so where the earth sees the sun, where the earth sees Mars, that they would appear in the nighttime sky are No matter what system you're using to describe the event, the way they put, the way they're, what they're, what they're describing is all the same. So they're all, I guess you'd say, all, all true. Yep. So even though even though each of the the lines of vision are the same, it's not just simply saying that like, well, this is this is what the data describes, but it's saying we're we're. Pepper takes it up again in chapter 21 to what he actually uh, the title of it is actually what I said at the beginning to what extent would a false hypothesis yield the truth and this is where he demonstrates he actually the funny thing about it is that he is showing you how you can manipulate a system that there is there you know there exists the potential to do so based on observations he makes up a geometrical description for the orbit of mars and the assumption is that if mars was moving in a in circular on a circular path or a circular orbit in uniform motion that every time it would obviously go through the quadrant equally that you would it would take the same amount of time from the from this position here to this position to that position it would be all uniform but what he discovers is that it's not true that Mars where he predicts Mars to be if it were uniform circular motion uh, it ends up coming up a little short that the amount of time that it takes the planet to go from here to here is the same amount of time it takes to go from here to here. So what he does, I'm not going to go through it uh, very thoroughly, but he actually, throughout the chapter, this is where he creates um, motion of the planet along the eccentric, or an eccentric circle. And 
he can work through this. It's actually pretty fun to see how he does it. Um, he divides it into eighths and creates two models based on that. So. Texas? Oh. So, um, so from that standpoint, you're getting a sense of, okay, well, you've got these different theories, you've got these different systems, how do you begin to determine what is true? If Kepler can make up a whole system to describe the orbit of Mars, just like that, he totally just created it. He knew it wasn't true, this is why it's so funny, because he knew it wasn't true, but yet he did it anyway to, to prove to you. I think he was probably cracking on um, the guys in part one to say, look, this is your dupe pedagogy, <laughs> that you can get duped by this. Um, so from that standpoint, uh, we're going to look at, you know, keeping that in mind, that this is something that applies directly to the music work as well, because we all exist in a culture that where the music is extremely based on what your emotions are or how you feel at a particular time. And when people start talking about it, there's like this raw passion that, you, that I get a sense of from people on the street um, when they start talking about their music. And so we're going to investigate uh, what exactly is there to music. What is its existence? How do we begin to understand how what we're hearing is truthful? It's not an easy task, um, and it takes a lot of work. So if you got, we have chorus three times a week. We try to sing every day. And the more that you're consistent on the work, you can probably tell from anything else that you do that consistency and also an, a certain amount of intensity does really pay off. So you, just, you come, participate in what we're doing. Because it's only going to come through that, through the work that's been done, that you can begin to even understand what's being uncovered. I mean, up to this point, it's taken me like five years to do this class, to, to have a, a developing conception where it's very alive. Um, so, <clears throat> so we're going to take a look at uh, three of our closest friends here, Mr. Bach, Mr. Mozart, and Mr. Beethoven. Any um, lights? No, no, I don't. I don't need lights. So basically, the music that you have. This spans an, a serious arc of history, from Bach through Mozart to Beethoven. And uh, does anybody know the dates of Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven? No. <laughs> okay, I won't deal with that. <coughs> uh, like the, 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 you know, death, birth, Bach. This is the arc. The, the music that you have represents this arc. It's quite an arc. Um, and what we're going to take a look at, the reason why uh, Lynn brings it up in this paper, and this is something he's referenced for over the last 20 years, 
in his papers to the boomers, um, his papers to us now, is what's called the C minor series. If this doesn't mean anything to our guests, it's okay. Because you can work on it and figure it out. And it's, it's highly advised to do so, because it's a lot of fun. Um, and hopefully this will help guide you in the right direction. So the C minor series, there's something significant about the C minor series, or C minor in general. And it's hard to talk about music outside of the context of an actual composition. It actually doesn't make any sense for us to do so. So we are, we're going to be digging into these pieces um, just in a minute. I just need the front light, perhaps. Oh. Okay. You can see it? It's pretty bright. So there's something significant about um, the human singing voice. I mean, where do you, if you think about music, did music come from the birds? <laughs> chirping away at each other? Or <laughs> did mu does music just come from the instrument? Right, it's kind of just what comes out of it from the F holes. It has all these vibrations and that's what, yeah, there's F holes on a cello uh, that come out of it. There's these frequencies, vibrations, that that's essentially where music comes from, right? Did the violin, this is kind of like the, did the chicken come before the egg, but did the violin come before the human singing voice? And if it didn't, then what was the process by which that violin was created or constructed? What led to the discovery of creating an instrument uh, and, you know, what was it actually imitating? What was the idea in the mind of the creator, not the creator, but the creator of the instrument, um, that led them to create something that would sound as beautifully as the violin, or the lute, or the viola, or any of those instruments? So every single person in this room, I don't know if you're a female, you're either going to be a soprano, a mezzo-soprano, or a contralto. And if you're a contralto, you need to tell me quick. <laughs> but, uh, we could use you. <laughs> and if you're a male, you're either a tenor, baritone, or bass. That's all you've got. Now, some people might think that's limited. But there's a lot, uh, as you can, you can tell with the dis, uh, compositions later, there's a lot that these composers have been able to do with just the six species of singing voices. But there are six, and I don't know, when people tell me this, it's like this, right? Everybody heard that? Can you tell that there's a difference? Or guess? Yeah? Can you tell that one's lower and one's higher? Well, which one's lower? So there, 
it's not a literal, you know, that the idea of high and low. We have specific registers, like you see this red area and the yellow and the uh, blue, yeah, blue and purple. Within, like I'm a soprano, um, and I so I have four different registers, and these don't mean really anything outside of the context of a composition. We can look at this all we want and analyze it to death, which is something I'm not going to do <laughs> um, to save you. But uh, within the context of, we're going to take a look at the uh, musical offering, that you see that there's a certain boundary that these voices come up against. Right? And this is what we call register shifts that there's something physiological that needs to happen in terms of a physiological change that needs to happen in order for you to be able to sing in this range in the most beautiful way. And you could stretch. This is, this is a, uh, like the first, what we would call the first register. You could stretch that into this second register. Um, maybe, have you warmed up today? Does anybody want to demonstrate uh, stretching up into the second register? Yes. Okay, Michelle. I got it. <laughs> Let's do a do still. Do re mi fa sol la si do. You want to do it again? Can you do it louder? No, I don't want to do it. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do. Very good. Oh, that's super good. Good. Oh, thank God. Thank God. Huh. Now, can you do it the other way? Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do. Did you hear a change for those guests? Did you hear a difference? In what she did between the first time and the second time. Which what? Which one did you like better? The second one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> your ears are very smart. Uh -oh. um, no, actually, it's not your ears. Thank you, <laughs> Miss. So, uh, so right. Okay. So, does truth actually exist in music? Is the pick on your guitar going to lead you into the pathway towards truth? Is that going to give you those frets on the guitar, all those, you know, little notches? Is that what could, what's going to lead you to understand more about the universe and to discover more about yourself within the universe as a creative being? And um, like I said, these shifts, which is what Michelle demonstrated in a very good way, it was clear. Uh, don't mean anything without the piece of music that you're going to look at. Do you have um, the richer car, Ray? Richer car, Ray? Hey, sir. Yes. It's the one that starts on the higher. You have two pages, right? No. Two pages of the box? No? Yeah, we have two richer yeah. cars. Which starts on the higher C, the Do above middle Do. Oh, okay. So, for our guests, I'm about to go through something that's very fundamental to understanding this. Um, we will do some like specific work uh, with you around it so you can understand it better. Some of it might go over your head, some of it might not. But just stick with it. We're going to apply it to the composition in just a second. But um, so we've, there's these things that we've been studying about, not in and of themselves, but it always comes up, these Lydian intervals. Oh. What uh, in music school they, school they call the devil's interval. Because this is what it sounds like. A 
although it's actually very beautiful, but it's not beautiful when it's not really going anywhere. <laughs> you have a series of six Lydians and then you have no idea where it came from or where it's going. But the key thing about understanding this, what we call a Lydian, um, I can write it down for you, is there's a specific action that creates its existence that it's generated through an action. Um, oh, just kidding. I just saw it. Lydian. Um, if you have, can somebody help me raise this? We're just going to do something fun. Those people that are sitting around you, we're just going to generate uh, a few of them just to give you a kind of a hands-on type experience with it. Do you, do any of our guests have any uh, background in music? Do you know how to read music? No. You do? Axel knows how to, yes. <laughs> Good. Okay. Well, we're just, we're just gonna do a few then, and then the people around you can help you work through the rest of it. But we're gonna generate a Lydian. You could call it a scale. So basically, you you should start. Everybody do this. Everybody start on do. Here we're gonna sing it in a minute. So. Basically, in how to generate it, you have, you're going to go up a minor third, augmented second, and then up a half step. And then what you do from there is you're going to use this, the same dough that you started with, and you're going to invert the direction. So what's a, a minor third up from Do? Mi flat. Huh? Mi flat. Mi flat. So anybody disagree? No. Right. Mi flat right there. Okay. What's an aug Does anybody know what an augmented second is? Mm -hmm. You know what a normal sec uh, se major second is? Augmented second is a further half step above that. Right. And then what's a half step above flat sharp? So then we're going to start from Do and we're going to do it backwards. We're going to invert a minor third, augmented second. We're only going to do one and then I can tell you what to do for the rest of them. This is just to give you an idea. So backwards, yeah. From a Do back, a minor third. Do. You're close. Close. Anybody? La. La. Oh, A? Yeah. Augmented second down from La. So what's what's a what's the next? A whole step down from La. Sol. Sol. So what's a half step down from Sol? Fa sharp. Fa sharp, right? Fa sharp, down a half step. So you can keep generating these. It's you can't go on ad infinitum because there's there's actually only six of these that these relationships. When I say six of these, I mean these relationships 
uh, of Lydians that exist in the entire universe. This, hmm. this is a, uh, what are they going to do? Create a Lydian scale? Uh -huh. Or in both, in both cases? Yeah, we're going to sing it. This is the ascending one. you would start on would be the fa. There's a, there's a excuse me, a certain progression um, to the Lydians, but what we're going to do now, the reason why, we're going to go back to the idea of the C minor series, because once you create a Lydian, once you recognize one within the context of a piece, this is why you can't look at music outside of its relationship to the human singing voice. And this is what, you ca what can begin to give you a guide to determine whether what you're looking at is truthful or not. And you can investigate into it. Because there are universal principles that can be discovered in music. And so, as I said before, there's six of these in uh, Lydian intervals. Um, I guess I could get some. Uh, you can yell out a bunch. Uh, F, prudential, Um, what are the other two? Do, 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 not lay. Oh. Oh, no, not lock, lay. Oh. Ray, uh, ray, ray flat. Ray flat. Ray. And then one more. So this might not mean too much to you, but if you do some more work, it'll start really giving you a sense of um, the actual universe that you live in. And so if you, does everybody have their first, the richer Kare, yes. the first page? The one that starts on the higher Do, the, the Do above middle Do. Huh? Yeah, the one that doesn't say six. So basically, if you made a list of all of these derived Lydians, you're actually already implying every single species of the human singing voice within this context. Yeah? It's the relation. Yeah. You go to music school, don't you? <laughs> yeah. It's the relationship between the Do and the Fa sharp. It's the action between them. Huh? Yeah. Oh, sharp fa. Fa sharp. Sharp fa. So, if you take a look, think back to the, the grid that we had of the human si singing voices, every Lydian has a relationship to, to a shift in the species of the human singing voice. And so now what we're going to take a look at is this uh, musical offering. And this is, Bach wrote this um, 17, around 47. 
His son was actually working in the court for Prince uh, Frederick, or King Frederick of Prussia, and had been working at the court, 1740, uh, had been there for about seven years, and Bach was a pretty reputable person around town. I mean, he had 20 children, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, so he he just had a reputation. I, mean, I was telling Aaron this the other day. What'd you say? Because Oregon didn't have any steps. So I like going. It's my favorite joke. So I know. Um, he was extremely well known. You know, he has this family of six generations. He came from a, a lineage of six generations of musicians in his family. And not all of his children, well, either survived or became great in music. Mostly what you hear about today is Carl Philipp Emanuel and Wilhelm Friedman. And these uh, are the two that stuck closest to understanding what their father was doing. Um, so Carl was serving as the court you know, choir, not choir, but music director for the court for King Frederick. And so, you know, King Frederick, being a very flamboyant person, was like, well, we must have your father come and try out my Silverman pianos, forte pianos, where he, there's this new brand of forte pianos that had just been discovered, and he had basically every single model in his um, estate. And so Bach finally makes it there with his son Friedman to go see Carl and also uh, accept the invitation to see King Frederick. So he gets there, and the first thing they do is he just pulls, there's a whole every, uh, I think it was one evening a week, um, he would have all of the musicians from the town come into his court, play music, read music, and that interact with each other on that level, something which we do on every Sunday, uh, in which you're invited to. So Bach gets there, barely is out of his carriage, and King Frederick pulls him in and takes him from room to room and tells him, just try out these pianos, just do, do what you want. And it's not really documented what he did play, which is unfortunate, because I'd like to know what he was uh, trying out the forte pianos on. But so he went to these rooms, and then finally, towards the end, Bach asks King Frederick, well, why don't, you, why don't you give me a theme? And King Frederick knew that, you know, I was telling Aaron this the other day, when he walked into a church, he could tell based on the acoustics of the church, based on how the church was organized. What did I say? Oh, sorry. I meant Bach. Frederick's not that great. So uh, Bach would go into a church and tell based on the organization of it, the wood, whatever, you know, what have you, and he would be able to go to the organ and improvise a fugue that would actually fit the acoustics of the church, that would suit the acoustics of the church in the best way possible. And you know, so King Frederick knows about this, so he's like, well, I'm, I'm going to give you a theme and see what you do with it. It's like his little test. And so this is what he gives him. He gives him um, this right here. I'll just play you the theme. The one that Bach composed at King Frederick's house, or mansion, or whatever the hell, estate, was this one that you see, the three-part Richard Carre. 
which is what he did on the spot in front of King Frederick and the entire entourage of musicians that were there to hear the great Bach. And that's what he created. He went home back to, I think it was Leipzig, and elaborated on it, developed it even further, thought that it, this is just completely uh, undeveloped. I can't give him this. So he created a six-part Ritschokare, engraved it, and sent it to the king and said, this is for you. This is now the final product, which I'm going to call the musical offering, uh, which was then dubbed the, the Prussian Fugue. But we're going to sing the theme in the lower register, the Pazutakari on six, right? It's a little bit different, tiny bit different. Or you want to sing it on solstice? There we go. Yes, if you don't know what solstice is, uh, you can just do it on yell or whatever you want to, whatever. Don't you feel like you're in King Frederick's living room? Um, okay, so this is significant because I'm going to play uh, a little bit more of the, of the very first Richard Carice. So you can hear the entrances of the, the second voice and the third voice. But if you take a look um, at the Richard Carice at six, he starts it in the alto voice, and what happens in the, within the first three measures is you have, because you always want to think about it in terms of the human singing voice, so what's happening there? You have... that exist because what's acting on the organization of it is as soon as you get to the fa sharp fa you're dealing with a registration shift for the soprano not just for the soprano but also for the tenor voice um, the baritone voice and also the what is it Soprano, mezzo soprano, tenor, and baritone. Like those are the register shifts implied there. And when you get to the one, two, three, four, five, fifth measure, the mi to the mi flat is a registration shift for the mezzo soprano. Or no, the alto. Four. 
measure five. Yeah. Because you have this interesting idea at the beginning where she starts out in the first register, goes up into the second, and goes deep back into the first register. Which really just calls your ear's attention, your mind, your mind's attention to what's happening. But through that chromatic line from the third through the fifth or sixth measure there, you're actually crossing every register shift for the, the human singing voices, the species of the human singing voices. And what's, so, what's totally amazing is that he's able to create an entire coherent composition out of this relationship. So I'm just going to play the first part um, to give you a sense of maybe like what was going through Bach's mind. And I'm just going to do it from the first Richard which is the three voice first kid who we have. Um, uh, just up through the second to last system, which is the uh, show on the right there. That's how intense Bach is. Uh, that we're gonna we're gonna take a look at this this dialogue um, into the next. Oops, I erased from outside. Uh, the next not generation, but the next arc in terms of history. Does anybody have? Oh. This is part of the C minor series. So it's a part of this, and the, the C minor series, this is where you have the pivot um, of the vocal registration. And we have, in our organization, we've had this consistent fight around tuning. There's a specific um, principle to, to be discovered around the question of tuning. And you hear I mean, we can have examples. There's a continuation of the class on Wednesday, which everybody is invited to, where we're going to get into more composition um, and around compositional method. But does anybody have any questions uh, about the Richard Carey? Yeah. Huh? It has, because if, if you take a look at the um, the register shifts yeah. for the, the human, the six species, right. he's kind of, it's a joke in a sense, where he starts on this sol, fa sharp, fa, mi, mi flat, re, re flat. You're crossing, basically once you create 
this ambiguity, when you bring in the other voices, you can create the, the um, action of the Lydian. By itself, he's kind of just teasing you, like, okay, well, what do you think I'm, what do you think I'm implying here? Because the underlying implication is that he's actually moving through all of the vocal species, just even within that first. That's what I'm saying. If he's going through all, I mean, I don't know the elevated way it's talked about, but mm -hmm. the generic way that people talk about a key is based off of how different key signatures or flats or whatnot, right? Right. But if he's going through all the flats and sharps, how are you then able to say it's C minor? That's the funny thing. Because the mode that it's in, it's not just C minor. And it just doesn't, you're not just talking about a key. You're talking about a specific organization within a mode. This is C major, C minor. And within that mode, you're already implying its organization within all other modes. So in the sense of box breakthrough, before this, we're going to go through this on Wednesday, uh, his compositions were considered completely crazy in the sense of, like, they just sound totally unnatural. Bach? Mm -hmm. Bach's compositions. Because he was, you know, the, the breakthrough in terms of the well-tempering, well, this is where you get deep into the root of the vocal registration and how Kepler, I mean, Werkmeister, which was, uh, I think one of a contemporary in terms of a teacher or a student, I'm not exactly sure, um, had called, huh? Of Kepler? Yes. Yes. Of Kepler, had called Kepler the greatest musician known to man. And so I think that, I mean, we can do more uh, research in terms of if Bach knew about Kepler, if this was something that was absolutely known to him based on the discovery and the, the, not the new astronomy, but the, uh, the harmonies of the world and how compositionally our, or our universe is organized in terms of our, its harmonics. Um, but this represents a pretty big breakthrough in terms of the span of musical development up until Bach. You, you wanted me to play the six part? Uh, no, I can't play the whole thing. It's six pages. Six pages? Yeah. Okay. Um, what page is the other one on? I can't find it now. Oh, there's no page number? It'll become a little bit more clear because Mozart... Oh, it's later on. Sorry. Mozart, um, you can tell through successively through the generations. I mean, even in our in our sense of uh, discovery of anything, as you go through the generations, it's supposed to get better. It's supposed to get more comprehensive, better understood. And when we take a look at it from Mozart and Beethoven, when you look back on this, you realize that the real foundation that we're coming from. Uh,
first line, when the soprano voice enters, right, you have this, within the last measure on the first line there, you have these rising fourths that generate this Lydian uh, on the, at the beginning of the second line. which is the kind of like the first relationship that you have that's generated. Of the second system, you mean? Yeah, the second system here, right here. That's a very explicit relationship that's been generated at this point. Up until this point, it's just been kind of a tease, a, a little joke. Like, let me see what, let me, let, me, let me show you what I can do just to keep you alert in terms of what I've what I've got in store for you but we're gonna why don't we take a look at the the Mozart go now to the uh, 457 does everybody have that page no 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 it's a, yeah it says Sonata 457 So part of the reason why this is historical is because before 1782, uh, Mozart was actually going to this man, uh, Baron von Sweeten's house, every Sunday. Like I said, kind of like Armand's brigade. And he was going to this house every Sunday and listening all day to Handel and Bach. And this is the first time, 1782, that Mozart was introduced to Bach. He was born in 1756. So he was only to live, you know, less than a decade longer. Um, I mean, he died in his 30s. Yes, Mozart. But if you get a sense, uh, do you have the sonata? What is it? No, that's the other one that's going away. So this is written 1782. He listens to, to Bach's, this is, he's actually specifically introduced to the musical offering, which is what we just went through. Um, this is written in 1784. strong C minor arpeggio. It's like very definite. This is what I mean. Thank you. 
which implies a do harmonic minor scale. So, so you're staying, he's keeping you in your mind within the same mode. He's not, you know, arbitrarily changing the subject in an unlawful way. That would change the subject if you were to stay in B? Because there's a certain relief of tension. I don't know, maybe I can explain it in a little bit. Remember, yeah, the, you want to hear the musical no, offering again? No, 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 can you play the nine and ten again? Oh, yeah.
Thanks, Akira. <laughs> um, so it's becoming a little bit clear, even in my mind. Um, so, um, let's go to. Yeah, you can have a question. Why would you? You invest, you, said you, you, played, you played the introduction with a C natural one? No, I played it with a C flat yeah, and, and a C natural. Right, yeah. And why, why did you think about playing it with a C natural? You mean with a C flat? Well, C is flat, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Mozart decided it for it to be C natural. So that you could stay within that mode, because as soon as you start on the G, that soul, and we 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 kept it. Do you understand now? Well, you, so you, you, so when you when it did maintain the tension, you played it with, with a flat. flat. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then key. Key I, I kept it in the key right. Right. of but do minor. Right. Did that? Did you, did you also keep it in the mode? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so uh, let's take a look a year later. One year later, okay, this is maybe 365 days later, one full cycle later, and what do we have? My goodness. Here, I'm going to play for you a very early Mozart piece, uh, just to give you a sense of, you know, this introduction prompt.
hold your applause till tomorrow. So, <laughs> um, this is. Does anybody have here a change in Mozart's mind? Perhaps an advancement? Mm -hmm. Can you hear the original from the Bach? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe no? so. Maybe I'm going to. It it sounded like it had a lot more of that, like, that kind of conversation. Between the voices? Yeah. Hmm. That's a good idea. It just starts to become more of like chorus like. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, Bach, uh, if you can hear the rest of the Bach, it's going to give you a very good idea of choral principles. Um, but do you guys remember the, the theme to the musical offering? I'm just going to deal with the first. The very first tune I did in the musical offering for him. So it's... registral shift in the human singing voice. And, I mean, do you notice that even within the first measure, he's already compacted it? It's kind of like him putting the punchline in the first measure. The joke exists in the first measure of the paradox is already within the first measure. And um, you have within the second measure, there's this hovering around the fa sharp and the soul. Do you people see where I am? Between the, no, the second measure. register shifts um did you want to say something no, oh the first chord mm -hmm. but what is the actually go back to the first measure what does the me flat and the fa sharp imply you're already Im he's already implying four different species of the singing voice in terms of their register shifts uh, which would be the soprano, the mezzo soprano, the tenor, and the baritone, all within that first measure. Because that was all happening, and you didn't, you didn't know it, or did you? But you knew it, because <laughs> you have all of the discoveries in your mind as a one, and you're uncovering them throughout the course of your life. So do people get? the significance of that first measure, where you have this me flat fa sharp relationship, where you have this shift in register for four species, already compact into the one. Um, so, huh?
Yes, it is. Okay. But let me remind you, you're not looking for the notes and how the notes can be superimposed on the other notes. Yeah, what would this be in? If you, what, what would this be in if you were to say it's going to be? He writes it in do, do minor. Maybe a conceptual quote. Mm -hmm. uh, Anna, what were you asking? Oh, uh, I was just a C minor fantasy. Oh yeah, yeah. He just doesn't write any. They just don't write any accidentals or anything. Well, he didn't because he's this. It's a, it's a funny, I guess, musician's joke, right. is that he's actually attacking these, you know, literal, formal existentialists that are saying, well, like Rameau, who we're going to go through on Wednesday, who goes, well, you know, this is the key. You can't stray from this key. You can't stray from this mode. Huh. Okay. Um, and these guys, Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven, are complete revolutionaries because they're saying, well, screw you. My, my boundary for creating music is beauty. And that, which is beautiful to me, is what actually has its direct relationship to how the universe is organized. Which means what I do as a composition is going to reflect those principles. And that's why we're looking at the human singing voice. That's why we're looking at these registers. That's what is implied within uh, that, you know, this breakthrough that Mozart had with even within this first measure. Because you have this, you know, he's implying within this. He's already implying those four other voices. And he's playing around with it um, and breaking the rules of the day. Because the rules were, that would never have passed. These guys were considered the worst you know, musicians and craziest composers because they weren't doing what was standard. And, um, you know, he develops it much further, which could be for another time. Hey, Mom. Yeah. <coughs> Were you going to play this, that part of the fantasy again? Yes. Because maybe I'm just going crazy because of this. Mm -hmm. It seems like I heard it in other parts too. Like, um, well, you could just sing this whole little bit. Yeah, sure. From the beginning? Yeah, just, just the beginning that part. That thing, no, the thing that you just, like, the whole thing you sing. Oh, yeah, he restates it in a, in a, a half step down in third measure, doesn't he? Yeah. Like a slight variation on meter. It's a very, yeah, it's a variation. Yeah. Yeah. So, your idea, the funny thing is that the poking comes in from the from the standpoint that your idea of the theme, if it's literal, you're gonna start your sphincter starts gonna start getting tight. Because you're always looking for the literal. Yeah, tight sphincters don't work here. Oh. <laughs> That's okay, it's good. So um, let's hear just the first uh, what did you say, the first take? Yeah, just the whole thing. Just whole whatever thing. you played. Yeah, <laughs> 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 
one part where he uh, in six measures. Uh huh. Hang on, all the other ones he goes. Maybe I'm wrong. Never mind. Sorry. Okay. Um. Okay. What did you? Six measures, but uh, I think uh, and this is a funny scene. It's weird. The major and minor keys. Uh, <laughs> Mixed together. ambiguous already. And uh, it starts off with C minor, and it's got this weird major key, it's got a minor and C major, that's a... Well, you play the first two notes, mm -hmm. and then you're in C minor. Mm -hmm. You play the third, the Fa sharp, and where are you going to go? From Do, that means you could lead into G, which means you have this whole, you're already implying, much more than just what you started with. Mm -hmm. Six majors has this quality of major. It's kind of uh, a little bit like at home thing. Uh huh. Uh huh. It goes back into the same darker trio. Yeah, right. Yeah. And you can get it. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Yeah. This part that goes like. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, it's a, it's a, con he's playing around with it. So he's, he's actually exploring basically all of the boundaries. And he's breaking all the boundaries at the same time. Because, you know, he'll, he'd say it's not within the notes, but he can still have a, a dialogue with Bach in this way and actually make it better. That it was through Bach that you have this, um, you know, this advanced dialogue that he's taken on on the shoulders of Papa Bob. <laughs> so I could go through more of that, but let's take a look at what um, Beethoven does. You guys have your sheets? <laughs> now this is, you know, up to this point, there doesn't seem to exist within society anybody that's or, I mean, Brahms. Brahms is different. We're going to stick with Beethoven right now. Um, uh, but has surpassed his method of composition. And I don't know, are our guests familiar with Beethoven at all? Sort of. Okay. Good. Um, so this is in, what, written in 1822. This is uh, the Opus 111. This is by far fast becoming my favorite work, um, or highly, high, highly regarded in that sense. Um, but at the, <laughs> it's funny because Beethoven's one of Beethoven's contemporaries was heard uh, heard Beethoven commenting on Bach, and he said it in German. He said, "Nicht Bach." Mehr sollte er heißen, which means he shouldn't be called Brook, which is the name of his, which is the meaning of his name in German. Bach is Brook. His name ought to be Ocean. <laughs> and Beethoven, around the age of eleven, all he was playing was the well-tempered clavier, and this was his foundation in his musical study. And he was getting very well known around that time in Bonn in Germany, um, playing. He was very reputable because people had said he had a most magnificent way uh, with the keyboard. And it's also been heard that <laughs> he was kind of playing around uh, in, they would have a lot of social gatherings where they, you know, they would go to his house. I had the good fortune to visit his house. And you can imagine his piano was, you know, on the side uh, near the window, and people would just come from all over the neighborhood and come and socialize at his house, play music. They would sing in the house, and there was just this social environment that was created. And at one of them, it was said that he he kind of poked at the audience and said he was playing Bach, and he said, "Bach, is he dead? Is he dead? You know, in the, in the sense that like is he 
the the irony is that he was dead because this was like you know 1770 to 1827 but he's already posing the paradox in people's minds like you know there there is this relationship across generations that we have with these historical individuals so um I'm just gonna play and we'll go
Did you guys hear? Yeah, it's a lot harder because it's not as apparent. And he has at the very beginning already this E flat and Fa sharp. this entire one. So that's already implied, but then you don't hear, he has this entire, uh, I guess you could call it an overture to the second place, the Allegro con Brio ed Appassionato. Did you hear it there? terms of the this uh, dialogue across generations. Um, I have a lot more I could go to. But uh, we're going to skip to the Arietta. Do you have that page, 603? Well, not the whole thing. Is the whole thing in the music that we have? Yeah, the rest of it. At least the non Yeah. Well, I'm not going to play that movement. I'm not going to play the variation. But I will go through <laughs> I will go through the triple trill that Liberty talks about. Um, but this is this is the uh, Arietta which says Adagio molto semplice e cantabile, which is already implying Bach says he is singing. Singing through the voice. Molto semplice e cantabile. Quite simple and singing. A uh, singing man.
to the variations, which you can see here. I don't think we have the stage for this. Uh, I'm going to, what year is it? Sorry. I'm going to skip to page 610. Before you did JoJo and Arietta? Yeah. No, I just wanted you to hear the second oh. movement.
I can't. I'm not. I can't say that I. I didn't. I can't. I don't know if it was necessarily the same voice or different voices, but mm -hmm. what I did hear was the uh, in the box offering. Uh huh. You have the uh, musical relations when it's ascending, and then the musical relations when it's descending. I kept hearing it going back and forth, but it wasn't completely thin. Yeah. He would go part way in this in this in this place. It would go part way descending. Yes. And it wouldn't complete. Yeah, right. Yeah, because it's and then it go back to it. And then I don't know. I couldn't tell where it was at afterwards. But then the speaker here came back in again, descending again, but yeah, not completely all the way to kind of play with your mind. Ha. That's why I laughed. Yeah, he's really crazy. But I, uh, I don't want to spoil it for people. Well, I have, well, I have two things. One is I heard the lower voice in the at mm -hmm. the end, and the other thing is one of the trills sounded like the trill not from the the musical offering when Jeff's playing. The one you played earlier in the night. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm the thinking Mozart? No, the trill. You know how you play two musical offerings? The first oh, right. and the second right. one? Yeah, yeah. It sounded like that was the trill. The higher one. Yeah. yeah. Not the one that you played right away in the most in the Beethoven, but the one like later on. Yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, I know what you're saying. So I'm not I'm not gonna spoil it for people. People can okay. hopefully that's So, Aaron's disappointed. It's okay. <laughs> oh. So, hopefully that gives people um, a beginning, at least, taste. And, I mean, I rest assured, I will be doing much more work on it so we can ha have more fun. Um, but I think what's necessary to know about this and why this, not just the C minor series is brought up, but that we have to take a look at it from a universal standpoint. That 
the original funny question, like, okay, well, Bach is dead. Uh, can we have a relationship with him? Can we have a relationship with Kepler? But this is, this is somewhat of a proof, of a physical proof, um, conceptual proof, that these three minds spanning uh, years, decades, were intimately, were intimate with each other from the standpoint that they were acting in history as creative beings to expand human knowledge around the, the idea of creative beauty. Um, and so I think that's what I uh, wanted to leave people to think about is it's really not within the note. And that's not what our youth movement or our organization represents. We're not studying Kepler so we can become master astrophysicists and master conductors and uh, uh, composers. That's not really the point. I mean, we go into Congress talking to these guys about the equivalence of hypotheses and then Mozart's C minor fantasy and what that has to do with the organization of the planets in the solar system. To what end? Um, and getting a sense of the relationship between Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven, that you have the, the irony that they had the most intimate personal relationship, yet they never really knew each other personally. And here we are, 2007, August 18th, um, uncovering this. I'm sure Mozart's sitting up in his grave, twiddling his ears, uh, Bach, Beethoven as well, because this is exactly what they did it for, is for people to discover beauty and discover their own creative beauty and be able to apply it for future generations just like they did. Um, so with that, uh, I can I can open up for questions, and it, there's going to be a class on Wednesday. It's going to be a, a bit different, but it's stemming out of the same idea. Is there any question? Yeah. Oh, I really don't know. I was never taught tea. The British tea. No, I don't know. I, I've heard tea and I've heard sea. So I don't think there's any formal reason why we chose sea. The same, in terms of the sharp soul? Yeah. It's hard to sing on T, and it's it's a little bit more mm, uh, accessible on the C if you were to sing a scale. Yeah. Yeah. He's done this for the past twenty years. And, I mean, Aaron just showed me today this from 88 or, uh, was it 88 or 78? But, I mean, even in um, his documents in the campaigners in the 1970s, he was already me uh, mentioning the C minor series because it was laid out for the boomers. The boomers did, I mean, they wrote a whole music manual around, um, the first manual was about the, the register shifts, the human singing voices, and classical and artistic beauty. And then the second manual is supposed to be around um, instruments. But this is, the, we're kind of regenerating a completely new, um, not method, but we're rediscovering it. Hopefully, better.
The only time I've seen him explicit about measure numbers is in footnote four of this paper, music science or fantasy paper. I've never seen him, I've never seen, like, looked here. So, huh? I don't remember that. Yeah. Uh, my question is, um, with the, the thing that I got from the C minor mode, what makes it really unique is that, like what you're saying about the all the different um, voice register shifts mm -hmm. kind of align with this mode. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems like taken out of the context of the voice quality itself, like how would somebody, is, is the only way to understand that, to understand like very deeply the singing voices in all the different species? Because the piano is not experiencing those register, register shifts the way that a human voice would. So how does the simulation differ from the actual voice? And like, I'm just trying to find the location of how to understand the way in which a piano could simulate something which is not natural to the human, mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah, I understand your question. Mm -hmm. The funny part of the question is, because uh, you had said at the very beginning to separate it from the human singing voice. And you can't. As soon as you do that, uh, Michael kept bringing up this quote to me today from the um, Limits to Growth book. There are no limits. There are, yeah, there are no limits to growth. That um, the difference between a pianist, w was it a, a good pianist? Well, you're talking from musical theory. Yeah. And so the people who have, who have all the classes in music that have a good sense of the musical theory and the ones that don't. Mm -hmm. so that was, was like a question of morality. Becky's question, which I was just about to ask. Just to see oh, you know, in this thing, um, it's an object. It doesn't have an idea of register shifts. It doesn't have an idea of vocal species. But the person that sits on the bench should. Yeah. And if they do, and this is what Lynn gets at, and this is why the music, the second musical ma music manual is going to be extremely important for us to write, is because you applied. Um, I mean, you can hear it in shift, you can hear it uh, in what he does, that it's an extension of his mind. And there's already embedded an idea of singing within the playing. And Bach was the same way as well. He was, I mean, these guys actually existed within a culture that was always singing, that was always working on these, but, you know, Mozart would have people around him singing Bach's fugue. So it was a very natural thing to do. And it's something that, you know, if you do, started at a young age, you develop this instinct that Lynn has challenged us on to say, like, well, you have to, now you have to make this instinct intelligible. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, what was Zaki's question? Oh, the question was... Is he um, here? Yeah, oh. he's in the hall. Okay. Uh, from right here. <laughs> um, what is, like, if you take something, somebody like Wagner or something like that, what is the difference, like, what makes it classical and what makes it not classical? It's a whole other class. Is that the next class? I can address it. Tell him to come back. I'll think right, about Zachary. his question. We're picking you up for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so on that note, note, uh, we can go. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, you can keep the scores. Is anybody going to Union Station?